Ah, welcome to Eight Questions with <laughs> for Wednesday night. Um, that's right. Uh, this, is, this is Patrick from Have Cheeto Will View, and yes, I'm doing a double header. Um, uh, yeah, uh, we did our interview earlier with uh, uh Italian actress and um, uh, well, I should say Romanian Greek actress living in Italy, uh, Iva Lykos. Uh, we did an interview with her uh, uh, this afternoon, and uh, hopefully, if he can make it in okay, uh, we'll be talking to Chris Buckholtz. Uh, he'll be here hopefully within 15 minutes. Um, yeah, uh, but we'll see where we go. Um, uh yeah, Chris is a really interesting guy, too. And I've known Chris for over 30 years. Um, him and I both met when we were both doing music in San Jose. Um, I was booking live music, and he was reporting on it. And um, it wasn't until I got to Michigan that I found out that he is actually a World War II historian. Um, he has written uh, several books on, this, on the matter of the air war in Europe. Uh, covering several different fighter groups. Um, and he has appeared on many documentaries, uh, including um, including uh, appearing on dogfights. He happens to be on my uh, my most... Oh, here he is. Oh, wow, he's so early. Good, good. Ah. Okay. I'm just doing the I'm just doing the, the the setting up. Wow, you got a tie on. Why am I not surprised by that? I know. I well, you know old habits die hard. What can I say? And, uh, you know what? I think the last time I saw you at the edge, you had a tie on. Uh, pretty good. Pretty good bet. You know, the guy with the tie was my radio stupid nickname thing, and uh, you know, try to live up to it. I like ties. You know, the ties got airplanes on it even. So, uh, what do you got? What do you got on there? Oh, this this is a, a P51 Mustang tie, which is uh, I, think, uh, I think I think I got it when my dad and I went to the uh, Air Force Museum about six years ago. So nice. Meaning uh, we are starting to get some folks in. Our friend Shewind is back. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, we're talking to World War II historian and uh, author Chris Buckles. Um, yeah, I'm. You know, I think I really screwed the pooch on this, to tell you the truth. I did not do my due diligence. Um, <laughs> I, should have, I should have prepped it. You know what it is? It's sort of hard to promote this because most of what I do is mostly, um, you know, actors and entertainers and whatnot. So I have groups I can, I can, um, you know, I can, I can promote in. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, but now I, I, I have one. I, I joined one history group so I could promote this. I just wanted to see how it would feel, see if they let me do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want to, you know, bomb everybody and get in trouble for it. Um, so I actually peeked it, I actually peeked inside the group. Holy shit, man. You know, it, it, it's amazing. It's a, it's a, it was a, I was blown away. It's uh yeah. it's it's an interesting subsection of people. It really is. I mean, uh people people who follow historic history and it's interesting these days because there's always a political bent to everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, some people some people still think they're like uh like uh, every war we fought is this kind of two-dimensional good guys, bad guys thing, which is, if you're if you're actually a historian and pay attention, that is not the case in any way at all. There's yeah. um, there's uh, there's there's good guys and, and bad guys. There's ulterior motives. There's all kinds of things going on behind the scenes. Everybody's in it for their own thing, and uh, uh, you know the people the people I like to write about are people who sort of get caught up in it and are just there because they have to be there, right? They're they're not there because they made the big decision to go. But uh, they may have they may have wanted to do something like flying or something like that, and right. uh, that was their motivation. Um, yeah, I, I was just blown away when I walked when I w walked in the group. I looked around, and lo and behold, they're like they're they're holding Patton up as a, 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 as a, a you know like he was one of us. He was a right winger, and it's like <laughs> that's not true, and Patton. I don't. If I'm, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think George Patton ever saw a concentration camp, did he? 
I don't think he ever saw it with his own eyes. He may, have, he may have never seen him in person. No, I know his army's freed a bunch of them, but I don't think he went toured them. I don't uh, think he did. I, I never have read that where he went to any sort of concentration camp or saw the bodies or the, the survivors of those camps. Um, and I think his tendency toward, you know, everybody says that he was a, a, a sympathizer. You know, I don't think he was a Nazi sympathizer so much as the right wing would like to have him. I think it was based in ignorance. And I also think it was based in because he didn't like Montgomery very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, his thing at the end of the war, he was, uh, you know, his whole thing was he was a soldier and destined to be a soldier. So when the war ended, it was going to suck for him, right? Yeah. So after the, the U.S. started occupying um, Germany, uh, he talked to some press people about the idea of like, it's like, you know, what the smart thing would, would be for us to do would be to team up with these Germans who know how to fight and go after the Russians, which is a completely self-centered self, self -centered concept, right? It has nothing to do with how anybody else in the entire United States felt. It would, just given, it would have just given George Patton a chance to keep fighting. Um, uh, of course, Churchill would have loved it because Church, that's what Churchill wanted to do. Yeah. He, yeah. You know, uh, and, you know, he was he was absolutely terrified of Russia. Well, and if and if you, if if uh, you can put yourself in the position of somebody in, in 1945 in America, even even somebody not fighting in the war, somebody back in the home front, you've gone through now four years of rationing, four years of your neighbor's kids and your neighbor's uh, male relatives being killed in action. Um, you can't buy a new car. You can't get tires for your car. You can't get sugar. You can't get this, that, and the other thing. People were getting tired of the war. It wasn't like we're winning, yay! We're even more hyped up about it. It was like let's get this over with. So, right. so, the, so the idea of continuing to fight in the in Europe was ridiculous. The Japanese had a pretty good strategy going with uh, Okinawa and Iwo Jima as they tried to uh, try to cause such severe casualties on the Americans to make them think twice about invading the home islands, which inadvertently caused the dropping of the atomic bombs on on right. uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But at that stage of the war, we were tired of it. It was already you know we're coming up on four years of of all out war with the entire culture devoted to it and. Um, yeah, people to be, politically, you couldn't you couldn't have extended the war to attack the Russians. That's just an asinine concept. We we were actually running out of men. Yeah, yeah. In Not the many people know that, but we were actually running out of out of men to fight. Yeah, manpower was at, at a uh, at a premium there in in in, uh, in December 1944 when the Battle of the Bulge happened. They were they had to pull people out of cooks and musicians and all kinds of non combat roles and stick rifles in their hands and, and force them up to the front lines. And uh, training had dropped to a uh, a bare minimum, so a lot of replacements who went up to the line in Europe uh, didn't last very long because they didn't know what they were doing. Um, so all the all the uh, idea that World War II is this 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 good war is uh, is really you know it just kind of misses the the point entirely. The co the cause was just obviously the people we were fighting could not be allowed to to occupy Europe and do what they'd been doing for the past five years. Um, but by the same token, and same goes for Japan. But by the same token, um, you know, all, all was not rosy and 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 wonderful on our side. Uh, losing that many people, um, yeah. Pe I, I love how people say like, "Oh, well, you didn't lose as much as the Russians. You just didn't lose as many people as the Russians." So yeah, we, but we almost lost a half a million people. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? I mean, you, you, you look at you look at Russia lost twenty five million. Most of them by by Stalin then. Uh, Germany lost 12 million. You know, they were, I mean, they were responsible for killing 12 million. Uh, you know, the J Japan, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, that, that, those numbers are almost impossible to figure out because a lot of the atrocities took place in China. Um, so, so, uh, so yeah, compared to those other countries that were fighting in the war, we didn't lose as many. That's true. It's still, it's a, still a gigantic impact on a country at the time. I think at the time of World War II, we were like 110 million people or somewhere in that neighborhood. So half a million people, that's a big deal. You know, that's, a, that's, that's, that's about one out of every 200 people in the country being killed in the war. Uh, we have our very first question. Um, it says, so I have a question from my husband. Um, is there any real evidence that Hitler was researching the occult to win the war, or was that just urban myth? That is actually true. Yeah. 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 True. The, the, the entire myth of the Aryan uh Aryan heritage was based on the occult. There was a lot of things that that, that the Nazis uh, delved into to try to justify their position um, 
as as the top dogs in the world. And um, you know, if you can't find real, if you can't find real life evidence, go look for the occult. That's a good place. So they 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 spend a lot of time doing that, and it's a. Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty interesting how the things like the, like the swastika, which was a fairly widespread symbol, a lot of times a symbol of good luck, uh, Native American cultures. Um, the Finnish Air Force had a big blue swastika on the side of the airplane before the war, and of course the Germans co-opted it and ruined it for everybody. Um, yeah. But that, that's an example of them taking this, taking a taking a a, a symbol that has um, has a symbolic power and co-opting it for themselves. Same well, as thing with the SS runes, right? The, well, it's just the same thing as here with the with the with our own very own homegrown fascists to uh, take the uh, don't tread on me and they take the the mm -hmm. Confederate battle flag and they uh, they have totally misused and twisted it for their own. For sure, for sure, it's one of the it's one of the the hallmarks. It's like it, go grab a symbol that's pretty common that people are already accustomed to and 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 uh, stick your meaning. To it, I mean, we we have that to a certain degree with the with the American flag, for goodness sakes. You know, I put I put out the, I put out the American flag on holidays, and uh, uh, I, I have friends who are sort of like like, oh boy, are you one of those? It's like, what do you mean one of those? <laughs> I live in this country. It's my it's my flag too. God darn it! You can't take my flag away from me. It belongs to me too. Um, but uh, but yeah, what the, what what the Germans did to try to justify their existence was fascinating because they would adopt they would they would adopt some of these um, some of these rituals into their own Nazi set of rituals. Like every year, the, the standards of all the different uh, German units would have to touch the blood standard that was at the, at the, at the, uh, at the attempted putsch in 19, uh, was it, 1927 or whatever it was, uh, touching the blood of this flag, the, the, the new flag. And it's all this kind of r ridiculous stuff like that. To us, it looks totally ridiculous. But for a culture like Germany that had been through a lot of turmoil, had been through the First World War, um, had people looking desperately for an excuse and for for scapegoats, um, it it resonated, which is kind of scary because today we have got people who behave the same way. They yeah. don't want to, they don't want to admit that things are th things are um, the way they are for for reasons that work for some people and not for other people, or they're things are the way they are in their personal lives that are caused by their own decisions. Um, it's much easier to blame somebody else, and when, when you start doing that, you can fall into the trap of what happened in Germany in 1933. And uh, unfortunately, it's happening here. Um, you know, it's. I guess it really got the. I mean, if you look back, you know, you know those who are, those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. And I basically think our 1918, you know, which was for Germany, you know, the the, the Treaty of Versailles. I think it was probably for us now it was probably 9/11. You know, it's the one key element that started the ball rolling down the hill. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, there's there's a lot of there, there were a lot of uh, parallels to um, Nazi Germany during the during the uh, early two thousands. Of course, recently, um, yeah. you saw pro all, the, all the things that Goebbels basically wrote down as the credo for 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 an effective propaganda campaign were employed during the Trump administration. Um, it's it's very scary to see how that plays out. And I think the the the, the, the one of the most telling things and kind of funny thing too. Is uh, the whole idea that Godwin's law? You lose the argument as soon as you invoke the Nazis. Um, Godwin came out and said it, four years ago, "No, not 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 actually true in this case. It doesn't doesn't hold up everywhere, especially when people are actually trying to be authoritarians." Um, so so um, so yeah. Just if you, if you study that period, and I I, I encourage people to do it because it's really a textbook uh, on on how uh, societies free societies do this flip into becoming authoritarian societies. If, if I, 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 I firmly believe if you can identify those things coming, you can stop them. You can take actions to counteract them. Um, and, but, uh, but who, who would have ever, I mean, okay. I, I, I mean, I, I mean, anybody, I mean, I saw the parallel for nine 11, you know, cause you know, I watching, I was watching it with my wife and I saw the second plane coming in. And the first thing I said was, it's an inside job. We did it. We've done this to ourselves. And I said that before the plane even hit, just as it hit. I said, we did it to ourselves. And I just couldn't help but to think about it because, you know, it, it would enable Bush and Cheney to do whatever the hell they wanted. And that's exactly what it did. It opened the door and, you know, they, they you know, and it's just slowly have been going backwards ever since. Um well, I think I th I think uh, I think the Bush and Ch Bush Cheney uh, administration was really very opportunistic. 
they they let it happen. They, they I mean they didn't do it intentionally, but they also didn't put a lot of resources into preventing it from happening. No. And uh, as soon as they had their excuse, they went whole hog because they 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 figured they had everybody on their side. And um, yeah. You know, if you watch if if you watch the media coverage from that period, there were lots of peace peace demonstrations. There were lots of people protesting against the idea of attacking, uh, especially attacking Iraq, but also attacking Afghanistan to a certain extent. And uh, there were there they were there were people on the ground, inspectors in Iraq, saying the whole argument that there were map, weapons of mass destruction was was bogus. So yeah. so that was like our our Reichstag fire caused by yeah. somebody else besides us, very conveniently hitting us or or. Or very cleverly hitting us because they they kind of knew the uh, the the, tem the timber of the leadership of the country at the time. Uh, hey Sean, how are you, sir? Uh, speaking of propaganda, how did the uh, use of cartoons start as propaganda during World War II? Always found them so interesting by Looney Tunes and Disney. Yeah, that you know what I you know what that's a good you know we'll get to that we'll get to that we'll hang on for that one. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'm gonna go back here and go back to the center and let us uh, introduce you guys to how me and Chris met because I think it's I think it's awesome. <laughs> this is one of the it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. <laughs> so you and I met down in San Jose. You, yeah, you were doing live music. You were uh, I was booking and you were reporting for Bam Magazine. That yeah, I think I think when we first met, I was, I was on the RK, KSJS. I was yeah. there. I was there for like four years, I think. And um, um, because, because I was studying to be a journalist, I, I would get all the bands to come and interview, which is the greatest job in the world. Be, so I just hang around the station all day. You know, classes once in a while, yeah, sure, but hang around the station all day, and then and then everybody promoting shows would call and say, hey, you know, can we send so and so over and for an interview? And I'd be, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Let's go. And I was also the production director, so I knew how to, knew how to use a tape machine, we could do all the recordings and everything like, like that. And that uh, was the greatest thing in the world. So, so uh, I got to meet tons of people, and uh, and go to tons of shows. And so yeah. that's pretty much what I did. You know, that was uh, it was a blast. I, I, I tell friends, uh, I, I told some work friends. You know, work friends now are much younger than I am. So yeah. um, I got to tell them my friend Susie got kicked in the head by Kurt Cobain. At a show at Marsuki's when uh, Kurt was riding around on Mark Arms' back during a Mud Honey set, and uh, wow. they go, "What?" Um, well, first they go, "Like who's Mud Honey?" But uh, but also they, you know, they're kind of astounded that like you saw Nirvana in a, in a at a club that had a stage that was like ten inches tall. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's it was, it was it was a really cool time, and Ooh. I did write, I did write the BAM column about Bay Area. The, the South Bay, the South Bay beat was the name of the column. And I wrote that for a while. And yeah, was, I don't know what happened to Carla Hay, but it was like it was like, see ya. You know, I was all right with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, when Bam, unfortunately for Bam, they got rid of. They decided they uh, they would they would consolidate all their all their uh, efforts down in, in Southern California with uh, with an editor down there. They got rid of the editor up here. Who, by the way, went on to become the first music editor for a thing called Amazon. So he did okay. You know, nobody needs to worry about him. Um, but uh, but they also just cut basically somebody in LA did, did, could could not care less about San Jose music. So my my contribution to the magazine shrank and shrank and shrank. And finally, I think I, I talked to T Todd anyway about it, and he wrote about my comments about Bam. And that was the last I was in Bam. So life is hard. Uh, yeah. yeah. But but Bam Bam was just like, oh my gosh! It was like it, it wanted to be so much more than what it really was. It it never it, you know it. I don't know. I mean, there were some good articles in there, but the South Bay was always the hind end of everybody. You know, it was like mm -hmm. forgot. It was like the forgotten cousin. Yeah, which is always which always made me laugh because it was produced out of like Pleasanton, which is pretty much removed from every place, right? There's yeah. nothing happening there at all. No. So. Um, so, but, but, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a, it was a, uh, uh, interesting experience. My, my first wife was the, and it was the woman who laid out the column. <laughs> so, you know, worked out pretty good for me. Um, and, uh, I, yeah, I, I still have friends from, from, from that period that I wrote about my, you know, Alan Clapp and, uh, the guys from the band Crack, Mike Murdoch and, oh. and uh, people like that. So oh, I love Crack. Crack was hilarious. Crack was the funniest band. Cliff with his buzzy bee thing. That was just the, the most hilarious thing in the world. Yeah, that was a, they were fun. 
Yeah, these, these great bands that nobody, heard, you know, this is why it's so important if you're a music fan to get involved with your local scene, because there's music there that you just won't hear uh, in years, years down the road. That's that's totally deserving of being heard. Um, and you can be the person who kind of carries the torch into the future. But uh, but yeah, it was I remember, you know, seeing seeing bands like Spot 1019. I remember walking into Marsugi's kind of being down and I think Firehose is playing and Mike Wad goes like, hey, it's the guy with the tie from the stage and it's like right. wow this is like the coolest thing ever i feel like the 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 uh the the um you know the mvp of the show from mike watt for god's sakes so yeah man spot 1019 man that was one of my favorite bands too man i i, didn't, I never got a chance to book them but you know they played they played regularly so I, I did get to see them play so they were a lot of fun i didn't get to see i didn't get to see fire hose yeah, fire I, I interviewed Firehose about three times, I think. Once in front of the Brooklyn Square in their van, and during the interview, a truck crashed into the van. So it was the, uh, the, the greatest sound ever. Because like halfway through the interview, it kind of there's this big noise, and then it's the sound of us out in the street talking to the guy who crashed into us. And they, you know, <laughs> make sure he's all right. Pretty funny. Yeah. No, no, he just wasn't paying attention on on University Avenue. You know, that this this is you know. The, Ber the Berkeley Square, which is now the Berkeley Public Library, um, you know. Really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Things wow. change. Yeah. And the older you get, the the more you know where things didn't used to be. Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's like you know, it's like it slowly evolved. You know, the the music, even even back when I left, you know, it was slowly evolving. I got out here to uh, Michigan in in two thousand, and I uh, and I talked to. The, you know, I talked to the Yasek at the time out uh, here. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, I told him in a year that him and his clubs wouldn't be here. He owned three of the biggest clubs. I told him in yeah. a year from now he wouldn't be here because Clear Nation was coming to get him. You know, he's gonna they were going to come make him a deal he couldn't refuse. And about a year later, he called me up and said, I just want you to be the second person to know that you were right. I sold. I sold. Yeah. I sold. You know, and and music, live music has just changed so much now. I mean, clubs, by, clubs like Marsugi's are few and far between. Oh, yeah, it's it's tough, man. And, and not just few and far between. It's like you don't have time to establish yourself as a as a place, right? There's no there's no uh, there's no scene because the clubs come and go pretty fast. Um, uh, I, and I, my my friends, you know, Alan Clapp had a, his, his band called the Orange Peels. And they've been playing for for a long time. I mean, I, they asked me they asked me to play guitar. Alan asked me to play guitar on the Orange Peels, and uh, which I had to turn him down because I don't play guitar. <laughs> I well, can play the bass, but I can't play the guitar. But that's how that's how how friendly we were. Um, he uh, they stopped playing in the Bay Area a while back because they, they just can't they just couldn't get crowds to come to to events. And now um, he and he and his wife have relocated to the British Virgin Islands, or I'm, I'm sorry, U.S. Virgin Islands, which is which is pretty sweet for them. And um, and I, I I guess Alan's brought all of, his, all, all of his recording stuff down there, so I guess, I guess there's going to be some kind of weird mishmash uh, indie recording slash uh, Fleetwood Mac kind of smash together island recording scene going down there. But, more, uh, more power to them. I love the Orange yeah. Peel. That was one of my favorite bands too. Yeah, they're great. They, they, you know, and, and Alan is a super talented musician and uh, and, a, and a very thoughtful lyricist. And so, uh, yeah, I, I really I, I really hope. Uh, I, you know, I I love I love that band. So my way, way back when, um, uh, I, I knew Alan, and then they got a new drummer, and the new drummer was my best friend's husband, John Mormon, uh, who's himself a really great musician. And then Bob Vickers was in the band, and Bob had Bob had dated uh, John's wife, who's one of my best friends. So it was this bizarre thing. It's like this, like, like all my friends are gravitating toward the same band. They're they're ending up in the same band, and um, uh, they've had some. They've had some. They've had some lineup changes. And John moved from drums to guitar when Bob left, and Gabriel Cohn took over on drums. And now Gabriel is in Philadelphia because he he works in public radio, and you know, getting to work at WHYY is a is a really big deal. So they make it work long distance, which is I think the way modern mature modern bands are going to have to exist because. The way life is today, you, you can't just say I'm going to commit to hanging out with the same four people for the next 20 years, in the same in the same in the same circumstances, right? It's, it's you got to flex with life. Yeah, you, you can't. Yeah, mu music has really just changed. I mean, we're seeing that now. I mean, I always I always said it sort of went full circle. You know, back in the 50s, 
it used to be that all these bands used to tour on singles, you know, 45s mm-hmm. and go around and, and tour on those, getting the buses, you know, four or five acts, 10 acts, you know, like, you know, and then they tour on that and they, and they sell 45s. And now it's to the point now where that's what we're seeing now. Now we're, we're not seeing albums anymore. We're seeing artists coming out and selling singles. They release a new single, you know, yeah, and, you know now you can buy it off a of, uh, you can buy it off of Spotify or or wherever it is. You know you could download it. You don't have to worry about you know getting two great songs or three great songs and and filler. Now you just go straight to the to the meat. And yeah, artists, you know, and artists aren't making any money. You know that's the thing. They're not. You know even you know and any artist that makes a third album, that's they're they're that's amazing. You know that's even yeah. 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 Well, I, I, I was, you know, I'm, st- I still, I still buy music from people. I still buy CDs. You know, um, I was very bummed. I drove to Las Vegas last month for an, for some event, and uh, I, I, I got a nice stack of CDs together, like cool music for the road, and got my rental car, and there was no CD player. So cool. <laughs> that's 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 the life we're in now, right? It's all everything's all digital, which is which is yeah. Cool. I still got a CD player in my car. I, I still, mm-hmm. and I still got, I got about twelve hundred albums from uh from back back in the day um so i still got those but honestly i have not listened to commercial radio at all or bought a brand new cd in about 15 years yeah yeah i buy, um, I buy cds from from people i see at clubs um yeah. new bands especially and yeah uh, um i try to i try to support things that way but uh, <laughs> but uh you know it's it's, it's a different world and it's, it's interesting how people don't feel the need to own their media anymore, which I always find a little bit terrifying. The idea that you've got your, all your music on a drive someplace that can get uh, damaged or destroyed and, uh, and, and there it's gone in, in, in a very small way. Yeah. That's how it is with uh, uh, most of the folks in, in, the, in my chat here. They're, uh, they're into physical media. They're in the physical collecting physical media movies. Um, mm-hmm. That's what I've been doing too. I've been doing the, the movie thing. And, um, but yeah, I can't do digital. I can't, I don't even like streaming and the streaming. It's just, Oh, <laughs> I gotta have physical, you know, I gotta have it in my hand. Uh, that's just how I am. And I like, go, and I love going out and I love looking for it. Um, I was telling the story, uh, uh, a couple of days ago when I used to go inside streetlight records and, uh, I used to run across that guy, uh, from the band night cry. Um, oh God, I can't remember his name. I think his name was Craig. And, um, you know, he used to give me he used to give me lip because I go to the discount section, and he would just <laughs> say, "What are you doing down in the discount section? Go out there and spend some money out on the floor." And and we just go at it. You know, I really loved that guy. That guy was hilarious. And we always had a thing going on. Every time I come in there, we would start yelling at each other, and and, and, spend, and all, uh, the customers would just be like staring at us like we're weird. You couldn't do that now. Now everybody would be hitting the floor, wondering if we're, if we're both trapped. Um, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I worked. At, I worked at Streetlight for about a year and a half or so, and uh, um, I, I love that place. What a what a, great, what a great anachronism that place is. It's yeah, a, it's still going on strong too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Amoeba too. Amoeba still flo- floating around. Yeah. So San Jose's got this weird stretch on Bascom Avenue with two really great big uh, places where you can buy music, which is really cool. You know. And in between the two of them would have been where Tower used to be, so so there you go. Um, I want to go. I, 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 you know, like I can't tell you how how surprised I was. Um, I went ahead and you know I, I got out to San. I got out to Michigan, and uh, me and my wife we didn't really watch a lot of you know like a lot of fluff TV. We watched like uh we watched the Food Network and DIY Network and all that other stuff and. And I and I started watching the History Channel, and that's what I uh, I found. Um, you know, that's when I discovered uh, uh, dog fights, and that rapidly became my my favorite show. And I was just like, "Holy shit, I love that show!" Oh, I see, I've frozen. Hold on one second, my my ass is froze here uh, on my on my phone. Let me uh, see if I can fix that. Right. <laughs> I hate when that happens. Technology.
Well, Michael's, well, uh, Mike, or, or, or Patrick is trying to fix that. There we go. Yeah, I was, yeah. was going to mention, you know. Um, oh, so, go ahead, Michael. Let, 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 Patrick, Pat, start your story again, because I, I don't want to cut okay. you off. Be so, so anyway, uh, I got out to Michigan. I uh, got out to Michigan. Me and my wife, we started watching, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, Sean. John says, I'm watching the 1992 Mind Warp for the first time. Oh, that was from, uh, shoot, that was an early effort from, from Fangoria. I think Fangoria had a, a, a hand in that. Well, anyway, I got out to, I got out here to Michigan and me and my wife, we started watching, we watched uh, different TV. We didn't necessarily watch, uh, you know, like, you know, the regular TV. We watched like the documentary channels, the Food Network and whatnot. And so I started watching history and I ran across uh, dog fights and uh, instantly became my favorite show. And I was like, I used to watch that show, you know, it's like, it was just so cool. And um, so uh, my wife and I would watch that and uh, the new season came out and then the episode of the Tuskegee Airmen came out. And um, there's two things I, I remember so much. One, Phil Crowley, put so much heart into the, his description of that movie or that, or that, or that episode. If you go back and listen to that episode, he is just so into that damn episode. He was like, yeah. you know, I would have loved to see him do it. And the second thing is seeing my good friend, Chris Buckholtz there on the screen talking about the fighter, about the, about the, uh, uh, the Tuskegee airmen. And I'm going like, Holy shit! I had no idea he was a historian. <laughs> uh, we, you and I, we always talk music. I, I never knew. I'm going, like, man. You know, all this time, him and I could have been talking fighters and 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 pilots and battles. I mean, we could have been doing that. I've and, been a uh, nerd for so long. Oh, I didn't even know it. I had no idea. Um, you know, so I was like, I told my wife, says, "Oh my god, that's Chris. That's Chris Buckles. He he used to write music." And you know, bam. And I says, "I had no idea." And uh, how it was so exciting. Um, and of course, then, you know, like, you know, it's like history went ahead after the second season and they pulled the plug. And um, I, yeah. I was heartbroken. Yeah, it was it was an interesting show to be involved with. I was I was only in the one episode um, because I, I, my, the first book I wrote was about the Tuskegee Airmen. And um, so but but I, I was there when uh, I, Roscoe Brown and I drove over from the hotel. I went over and picked him up from the hotel for the for the interview session. And um they basically that if you're on that show, it's that they put you in front of a green screen with these two great big panel lights shining at you. And uh, they had to, I had to take off my glasses because the glare was so, so great from the, from these things. So the interviewer was like, was sitting about 10 feet away and I couldn't see them at all. Um, so if I look kind of stunned or, you know, <laughs> a little out of sorts on TV, it's, it's cause I'm like basically speaking blindly toward a person. Um, but, uh, but no, it was, it was, it was a fun show to be involved with and they did. And they did, put a lot of work into things like they, they invented a whole um, physics engine for the simulations. The, if the second season, the backgrounds got way better, it was, it was just evolving so rapidly. And so it's really sad that they stopped doing it. It um, really is. But, um, but they, I know that the, the technology that they, that they used has gone into other films to help simulate aircraft. Uh, Cause I, I worked on the, on red tails for George Lucas. I was a historical advisor. Um, and the, a lot of the technology to make to, to make the airplanes look like they were moving correctly was taken from the, from the same software they used for dogfights. Um, and uh, I wish that I wish the air, I wish that movie had been done with a little bit more seriousness in mind, uh, a little bit more of a. I mean, because the facts themselves, the story are really great. You don't need to make stuff up. They're they're I, all so solid. You don't need to make up story uh, a story. I, um, I I could not tell you how completely disappointed I was in the, in Red Tails. Red Tails, honestly. I mean, I mean, especially, especially find out you're up there, you know, as a technical advisor and you're telling them what happened, how it happened and why it happened. And they just completely like, oh, OK. And then they do shit that's just like, that's not even true. And then they fictionalized all the pilots. And it's just like, mm -hmm. do that. And it's just like, it was just such, it was so George Lucas. It was, well, I, I redlined, I, I went through three scripts. And uh, the, before the shooting script, which I don't think I even saw, but the uh, three scripts I saw were all completely different, and they all had different things that were completely wrong. You know, like like uh, the, the 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 great big gigantic railgun uh, 
you know, firing at firing in Italy. Well, that was over in that was in Russia. That was being used in Sevastopol. Or the uh, or, para, or paratrooper from the uh, 101st Airborne. The 101st Airborne didn't make its first drop until Normandy. They weren't in Italy. Um, you know, these kind of factual things. It's like, geez, just you know, talk to people earlier. Um, but the whole plot, the whole storyline kept changing from script to script to script. And that movie was 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 decades in the making. I mean, it took forever to actually finally get it um, committed to film. So so uh, I, I wish it had come out better. I mean, a story like that really should be like a miniseries or, or something like that. And there are so many real people that could have been great uh, yeah. characters or focuses of things. You know, you watch something like, like Band of Brothers, which has kind of ruined it for everybody because it was so well done and it so perfectly uh, captures the people involved. Um, you, you can do that with 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 uh, with a Tuskegee Airman. You can do it with like Charles Dryden in the 99th and uh, uh, with Colonel Colonel uh, Benjamin Davis and his whole experience putting the, putting this group together. And people don't seem to realize Benjamin O. Davis was not a good pilot. He was not a really good pilot. Uh, Noel Parrish, who was the second commander of Tuskegee Army Airfield, who really made the, the training regimen work, took took uh, Davis under his wing and flew him relentlessly until he got good enough to actually fly missions. And, and and Davis still kind of flew about a third of the time. He didn't fly most of the missions. Um, but but he was respected by all the guys in that unit to the point where, uh, you know, they would do anything for him. Uh, my friend Woody Spears, who was um, who was a Mustang pilot, uh, told this great story about uh, he and his wingman, they were they'd been drinking a little bit and the and the group had a B-25 that they used for, you know, hack flights, flying around getting parts or flying to, to places for for uh, for leave, they decided they, they would try it. They would take it up to Naples. Um, neither one of them knew how to fly a multi-engine plane, but in the state they were in, they figured, well, there's two engines and there's two of us. So one of us can we can each take one engine and we'll be fine. Well, it, they scared the crap out of themselves. They got to Naples. They landed. They were so terrified. They just got a Jeep and drove back to Ramatelli and uh, left the airplane there. And uh, nobody, no, no, it was, nobody knew officially who had done it. But Davis was really torqued at the time. So so 50 years later, there was a big Tuskegee Airmen retrospective panel kind of thing at, I think, the Air Force Museum. And Woody was invited. And Colonel Davis was, was invited. And uh, Woody hadn't seen Davis since he'd come, come home from the war. And uh, Woody walks up to Davis and says, says Colonel, uh, I don't know if you remember me. And Davis says, I remember you. You're the one who took my B-25. <laughs> <laughs> So he was that kind of guy, a disciplinarian. Also, also he was the guy that came up. This is not something in Davis's favor. He came up with in the seventies with a fifty-five mile an hour speed limit as a way to save fuel. So um, these these guys all had lives after the war. People don't seem to realize that. Uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, they just they just didn't cover it. I mean, you know, yeah. you got the you got the Band of Brothers, you got the Pacific, all covering real people in real situations, and 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 done it really well. And then you got red tails, and it was just like, I mean, I I tell people, you know, and I mean, I like the I like the the first movie they did with Lawrence Fishburne. Mm -hmm. I thought that movie was uh, you know, it was pretty, it was pretty well done, definitely well done, a uh, much better. And you know, I what really caught me, what really got me was like, with all with all the of everything that they had at their disposal. You know, it's one thing when you make a, you know, when you make up a movie about the Flying Tigers in 1942, and you really don't know anything about it. You know, you, you can only go with what you got, right? Mm -hmm. Very, very, it wasn't very much information out there. But here it is, you're making the movie, you know, you know, it's like the Band of Brothers or or the Pacific. You know what battles were fought, how they're fought, when they're fought. Same thing with Red Tails. So, but the, they took extra careful time and effort to make sure those those battles were just like they were back then and and, and they just didn't do that here and, and it really frustrated me because i'm watching this i'm watching the dog fights episode with uh with you and that episode is is my favorite that uh, by by far it's my favorite episode of the series and it's the most it's so it's so powerful you know um you know, the, the, you know, I, I'm just listening to them talk, and it's just like what they went through. And and at the end of the at the end of the episode, where they were, uh, I think it was I think it was Roscoe, uh, or or I believe it was. I don't. Yeah, and he mentioned how when the ship docked, they walked down the plank of the ship, and there was a sign that says, uh, "Color troops 
white. Yeah, yeah. It, it was just like mind boggling. Um, it's hey, uh, Mr. Bones, welcome back. Uh, 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 I have uh, I have people in the chat here, and uh, so I've, I've definitely got to say hi when they come in. And <laughs> Mr. Bones is a moderator for me, so thank you so much for that, Mr. Bones. Yeah, one, yeah. So far, I've been really blessed, uh, Chris. I've been really blessed in the fact that I've been doing this this little interview series for a little bit now, and uh, uh, I haven't had any really any trouble yet. You know, as far as uh, I've seen other places where they have tons of trolls and and uh, uh, um, so luckily I don't have that. Yeah. Oh, thank right. you so much. Uh, see wine and, and your husband, I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, it's about ready to get bigger and better. When did you start? Um, when did you start getting into, when did you get start your, uh, reading about military, uh, military history and battles and whatnot? That's best. Pro I, I mean, I, I've been I've been a, uh, a a nerd for a long time around this. When I was in back and back when we we knew each other um, at at uh, KSGS, there were a bunch of airplanes hanging from the ceiling. Those were all mine. So when I when I didn't have a place for them, I stuck them up there. A couple of P twenty sixes and a Huey Cobra, and there's a B fifty two that that uh, I distinctly remember when Kim Haskett knocked it off the ceiling on top of uh, of off of uh, one of the jazz DJs' heads. That was uh, that was there. So I always liked airplanes. Uh, I didn't start really writing about it until, um, and I built I, and I built models for a long time, but um, I, uh, I, I, gosh, when, when, when was it? It was about 1995, 96. Um, I think I was talking, I was complaining about the fact that at the time there were no good books about the Tuskegee Airmen that could help you build a model. There were there were some books here and there, but they were they were, you know, pretty low budget or. They generally treated them like a sociological experiment. They didn't really talk about the aircraft or anything they went through in World War II. It was like they got, they, you know, they fought for the right to be there. They were there. Then that was it. And it's like, well, no, they did a whole bunch of stuff while they were there. Yeah. Um, so I was, I, was, I was grousing about this to my editor at a, at a business dinner someplace. And she said, hey, idiot, you, you can write. Write the book you want to read. Like, oh, yeah, I could do that, couldn't I? And uh, since it was the 90s, I could actually go and talk to these guys. And... Um, you know, what, what I discovered was when you when you knew something about the airplanes and you, you knew something about their actual the actual things they did, uh, the conversations just took off. Um, it, was, it was it was no longer like, wow, you flew an airplane. Was it a was an F-14? You know, it wasn't that they get that all the time or they, or they got that all the time. And it just drove them crazy. But when someone when you walk up and say, it's like, were you were you there during the transition from the uh, the P-47 into the into the, the P-51B? And they go like, bing. You know, somebody actually knows what I'm talking about, or what I'm going to be talking about. Conversation was great, and so uh, I ended up. I, I talked to a lot of the guys in the Tuskegee Airmen to start with, and uh, um, I ended up the treasurer of the Bay Area chapter, which was kind of a kind of interesting, interesting uh, evolution because I knew four or five of the guys in that group who who were not guys who flew in the war overseas, but guys who flew with the B-25 group, the 477th Bombardment Group back here, which was which was basically sabotaged by its commanding officer, so it could never be fully ready to go overseas. Um, so the interesting stories. And, and I, it was, a, it was, a, it was a good timing for me because people were still alive. People were still available to talk and uh, I got to meet quite a lot of them. And um, yeah, it was, it's, 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 it's pretty funny. The, uh, the, there, there is kind of a fighter pilot type that is, you know, you, you got to, you have to sort of, you have to sort of cross check their stories against reality. But, uh, but a lot of the people I've talked to, uh, in the Tuskegee Airmen, a lot of people I've talked to, uh, in the 332nd, 362nd fighter group, which is a P 47 group, uh, primarily ground attack group, uh, were, were, were not fighter pilot types. They, they happened to fly fighters, but they were, they were ordinary folks just doing, just doing a real job. And, and the, and the thing that always drives me crazy is it's, you, you say, you say, Hey, can I talk to you about what you did? Blah, 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 blah. And they say, Oh, well, you know, I wasn't doing, doing I wasn't doing anything special. Everyone else, everyone was doing that kind of stuff then. Like, no, no, you were doing something pretty amazing. You know, just because just because the entire world was involved doesn't mean the things you were doing wasn't weren't, weren't really impressive and 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 important. Um, so so yeah, I've I've written I've written four books now on World War II aviation. I've got a fifth one coming out in, on February seventeenth uh, about the P fifty one Mustang in Northern Europe uh, from December forty three to to D Day. So, which is a very specific time frame, and it, that was that was really interesting. Uh, every every time I write one of these, I learn so much more, um, and that's, right. that's the fun part. I'm glad you're writing it because I mean, you know, especially 
it, it seems like it, to me, it just seems like there's less and less books coming out. And, you know, like, you know, we don't, we don't talk about the war at, at all anymore in this country. World war two is just not talked about. Um, you know, it used to be every, every year, the president would actually make an effort to go to Normandy uh -huh. or, or, you know, or Pearl Harbor. Um, you know, it used to be like when the, we acknowledge the day when we dropped the atomic bomb, but we, it's not even mentioned anymore. It's not, it's, it's all, it's all just, it's been, it's like been turned into a parking lot. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's things like things, you know, one of my pet peeves is, is uh, movies about the battle of Midway. I have studied, I've studied Midway literally since I was in sixth grade. I, I wrote a report about, I wrote a report about the battle of Midway that my teacher accused me of plagiarism because there was no way a sixth grader could have written something that, that long. Um, and and so the movies about Midway. I saw, I saw the Charlton Heston movie with my grandfather in Sense Around in the theater. And uh, remember, my grandfather said, "You know, the best part of that movie was the stuff they took out of Thirty Seconds Over Tokyo." Um, Tora 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 too. <laughs> oh and, yeah, well, the entire the entire film was like clipped from other movies. So so uh, with, with the exception of the actors, you know, the the big big budget actors. Um, and then 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 the uh, when the new when the new one came around. Uh, some of the people in the film depicted in the film I have had actually met in real life, uh, so so uh, um, that was a little weird, um, and uh, they were not portrayed <laughs> very close to the actual person, and uh, and uh, the tactics in the thing were completely insane, and some of the some of the uh, numbers of aircraft and things are were were wrong, and it's like there are books I can give I could have given I could have yeah. given. Uh, when when they when they announced the midway when they announced it you know they're going to do midway again i was really excited you know it was like um you know i was a little tempered because i was really jacked when i heard about red tails and i mm -hmm. said oh can't wait for red tails you know we're going to get the you know we're going to we're going to we're going to we're going to see the pilots that are talked in the dog fights you know in the episode we're going to see tuskegee airmen and then uh then when that mess came out and so when midway came out i'm like okay I'm really excited. And then I read the how they were going to divide a, the movie up into three different sections. I'm like, why do you need to divide this? You don't need Pearl Harbor. No. You, you don't need to talk about Pearl Harbor at all. At all. You don't need about the Doolittle Ray. Not at all. They're, the Midway, the Battle of Midway itself is more than enough for a freaking huge ass movie. Yeah. It, you, know, you want to do a three hour movie on Midway? Believe me, you could do it very easily. Um, and and uh, yeah, I heard it was just absolutely trash. It was some. It was kind of a mess. Uh, it did. It, it just looked. It didn't look really great. It was. It, was, it just oh. looked kind of video gamey, and, um, and some of the things involved, like the like, like Dick Best making a a dead stick carrier landing. It's like no, he never did that stuff. That's just ridiculous. You would, yeah. You would get you if he did it, he wouldn't have been flying in the Battle of Midway because he would have been grounded. Um, yeah. But uh, but you know I, I, I that battle has so many layers to it and so many things happen. You could just take one squadron and uh, have the have the film focus on one person in the lead up to that. Um, I, I interviewed a guy named Lloyd Childers who used to live in live not far from here. Oddly enough, Lloyd was the was the only surviving gunner uh, from Torpedo Four. Tor, for, uh, these, these TBD devastators that attacked the Japanese fleet. Three squadrons attacked, and I think grand total of about. Six airplanes got back um, out of three squadrons. Torpedo Eight was the first one in, and they got decimated. Two yeah, almost, was, almost two men. Yeah, you know, was John Walden's group. Yep, and uh, George Gay was the only survivor. Floated in the water until he got picked up. Um, Torpedo, I think uh, the, the squadron from the Enterprise came in next. You know, Lindsay's Lindsay's group, and they got pretty well shot up, but some of them actually got back to the carrier. And then Torpedo Four arrived. Um, Torpedo Four actually arrived about the same time as the Dauntlesses. So. The, the whole timeline of that battle is messed up by the movies because it never depicts it right. No. And, uh, Torpedo Four got shot up pretty badly too, and uh, I, I I knew uh, Lloyd pretty well, and uh, um, and he got he got hit by a bullet in the thigh and almost bled to death uh, for his troubles. Um, I also knew a guy named Tom Cheek, who was part of the fighter cover for Torpedo Four, and he he's probably the only person that saw the three carriers get hit. He actually saw them get hit. He popped out of a cloud and he, he said, oh, crap, there's the carriers. What am I going to do now? Should I crash into them? And all of a sudden they started exploding because the, the dive bombers were hitting them. Um, so so uh, so hearing the story from them, it's like, God, just take one of those guys 
and dramatize it. Take George Gay's book and write it from the point of view of Torpedo 8 preparing for the war. I remember Eugene uh, or uh, um, Lloyd Childers saying uh, before the battle, he said, listen, your chances of getting back here, we expect one plane out of 15 to make it back. And uh, he said they were flying in. These planes were these planes were not fast. They were like 90 miles an hour. They were really slow. Ass, with, with a torpedo on them. And the Japanese, of course, on a torpedo attack, you turn your, your stern to the attacking uh, bombers. And so he's, he's sitting back there with his guns waiting for the attack, and he's looking over his shoulder, and he's like, oh, my God, the Japanese carriers are gaining on us. <laughs> They're opening the ground on us. Right, um, right. That's right. I, I, I remember reading about that. Yeah, they were they they set up for their run, and then uh, uh, yeah, they were they were being taken out of the window because the carriers were moving too fast. Yeah, they were they 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 would, they, they would have to the carriers going this way. They, they would have to sort of scooch around them and get get a get a shot at their, at their bows. But um, yeah, so, so anyway, talking to those guys in person, you, you were like, "There's got to be a good movie out of this out of the Battle of Midway." You know, there's got to be something that comes out of that that's halfway decent, especially nowadays. We know. We now know basically where everybody was and when. Um, right. You know, I, I'm 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 I'm, bu I'm I'm building a model right now of a uh, of the B twenty six M A flown by uh, James Murray. Uh, there are four B twenty sixes that attacked the fleet with torpedoes. Two of them made it back. One of them was Murray's. He dropped his torpedo on I think on the Akagi, and then uh, pivoted right across the deck. Flew right down the deck at about. 15, 15 feet, 20 feet, and uh, um, the, the, the a couple of guys got machine gunned on on the deck of the of the ship from this this V twenty six, and he made it back. The plane is completely shot up. Another plane attacked the Akagi and uh, got hit, and the plane almost hit the bridge of the of the carrier. And there's a lot of speculation that that's what freaked out the Japanese Admiral Nagumo aboard aboard the Akagi and caused him to order a second strike on Midway, which started the chain reaction that delayed things until the dive bombers arrived. Oh, what a terrible mistake he made. What Thank a terrible mistake. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was a it was a uh, it was a terrible decision and um um it 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 it's 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 it, it set in motion a whole bunch of things that are that 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 went completely awry for the Japanese but went went really well for us. Um there's a book called there's a book called Shattered Sword. Speaking of speaking of writers, there's a guy named John Parshall, who was a friend of mine, who wrote this book called Shattered Sword, who wrote it from the point of view of the Japanese at Midway, and it's completely worth reading. It is a fantastic book. It is completely detailed, and it, it dispels a bunch of myths about the battle. Um, that, and there's another book called A Glorious Page in Our History, which sort of tells it from the American side, uh, which is just laden with facts and, and written by four really great historians. Th those two books existing is why movies like Midway shouldn't happen yeah you're right i mean it's totally laziness it's really what it is it's just sheer laziness and and, and especially when it got me is when when you were telling me how you were the advisor on red tails and i'm just thinking to myself i'm going like okay that's awesome you know that that's what they do they get these they get these advisors and they have them come on there and then they want to get it right you know and um and then you watch it and then you don't see it and it's just like you're totally it's you know I mean, it was just oh, it just it just kills you because you know you oh, want it, you want it to be really good. You really want it to be good, but you really want it to be truthful for especially not not so much for yourself, but you because I remember when that movie came out, how uh, uh, all you know I lived near Detroit, so all the social media was just all these folks were going to the theater to watch the movie. Go mm -hmm. watch you know go watch the uh, uh, Red Tails. You know you know it's our it's our story. It's our story. And and then of course I'm sitting there going like you know it's a piece of shit and then and then of course then I get people at, pinging me going like uh, why are you saying that and I'm going like because you deserve better you it's, deserve yeah. the truth you deserve yeah. the truth well working on the movie was interesting there are times I got I would actually get phone calls from George Lucas at home which is just the weirdest possible thing you know like, like George Lucas and Ben Burt are calling me up on the phone it's like oh it's, oh my god it's it's, it's George Lucas and R2D2's voice that's really amazing. Um, and I got to go up to the the ranch a couple times and meet with people, and that was cool. Um, but the, the the questions they would ask me were really oftentimes really tiny little detail things. Um, so a lot of stuff on the ground I helped out with uh, some some of the uniforms and vehicles and things. Um, I wish I wish they had somebody who could say like, "Hey, listen, spread everything out. This base is super compact. Everything just crushed in." And I know it's you got to get it in, in frame for the film, but uh, you don't need to have 
everything just on top of itself. I thought the P40s in that were pretty good. I thought the P51s were eh. Um, the, the German stuff, uh, there's stuff I just I said, you can't do this. You can't put that yellow tail on the German planes. That's completely bogus. Right. Eh. Um, but they always got to make sure they got to make sure the big bad always has, you know, a special plane. You got to see him. Excuse me, just one moment. Sure. Uh, I hope you guys are enjoying the interview with uh, Chris Buckholtz. Um, yeah, I, I dig the pictures too, Hobbs. And he's right. Uh, and I can't get her. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's right. I now that I, now that he mentioned that, I do remember that at KSJS, which, are, which was our local radio station. Um, there, he he had planes uh, hanging down from the ceiling. Oh, thank you, she Wine. I, I'm I, I'm glad you two are enjoying it. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for you guys co uh, coming up today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Chris knows the stuff. That's for sure. He he knows he knows exactly what he's talking about. I mean, that's what I love about it. You know, he's a he's a real he's a real. Sorry, I had a, a little puppy incident. Had to get the uh, dog back in her kennel because she was running around the dish towel. <clears throat> Very important. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, real quick, uh, could we talk about what, real quick uh, about the propaganda, uh, the propaganda war? Um, a lot of people might not know this, but um, uh, uh, oh gosh, brain tooth. Mel Blanc actually uh, was very well known in World War II for his propaganda films that I, I actually found out about them and then I, I saw someone had actually uploaded here on YouTube. Um, a lot of people did not know that he did a several uh, and those those propaganda movies, man, they weren't exactly all fun and games either. No, no. no they were just as uh, they, a lot of them carried a lot of the um, uh, they're pretty sharp sometimes in their, in their tone and they were they had a little bit of that racial undertone that was especially towards the Japanese. Um, right. But uh, but yeah, no, it's it, 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 the participation of things like Walt Disney in the war is pretty fascinating. So they, of course they did a ton of animated cartoons that were supposed to pump up the, 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 uh, the home audience. They also did things like they, they, they had the, the artists create logos for tons of units throughout the war. You, you know, if you, if you were an official Navy unit or official army air force unit, you had a pretty good chance of getting a, a Disney created logo. Um, in fact, the uh, the artists oftentimes would go over to the plant, the the, the uh, Vega plant, there near where Disney was based, and put art on the airplanes on the assembly line. Uh, a lot of the Vegas had over by the, the on the side of the fuselage. They have Mickey Mouse, or they have Goofy, or they have some character saying something about the war. And they were all unique, and so you, your, your airplane would show up wherever you were based, and it would already have nose art on it or art on it. Um, they are very involved. I think I think talking about cartoons generally is hysterical in World War II because you, you really can find pictures of cartoon cartoon characters, American cartoon characters, on everybody's airplanes. You can find the big bad wolf on Italian airplanes in the in the African desert. You can find Mickey Mouse on Messerschmitt 109s. You can find, you know, Cleo the cat from from Pinocchio on on Hurricane in the Battle of Britain. You can it's just amazing how much cultural reach cartoons had even before the war started. Um, and then when the war started, we, 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 we harnessed them to, uh, you know, drive home the points we needed to, to make here at home. There was, there was a cartoon that Disney made about air power that was pretty powerful that I think was not going to be released until, until Roosevelt himself um, put his foot down to say, yeah, we should, we should put this out. This is important for our people to, to see. Um, it tells, it tells a story with, you know, with no no uh no no blows no no punches pulled and yeah um I, I mean i saw the one uh, i think it was called snafu is the mel blanc character snafu and um you know the you watched the first couple ones it was just you know you know like you know sort of silly you know but then there was one where it was like loose lips you know sink ships you know and it got really dark and i mean it was like holy shit you know and ended up with the guy burning in hell and uh something about and 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 and, and the, the really shot me was someone saying because some son of a bitch couldn't keep his mouth shut 
And I was like, oh, and that was back in the forties. That was Jim. Yeah. It was like, oh, okay, that's a that's different. You know, that's that they're, they're not pulling any punches. Um, but well, yeah, the propaganda. I mean, the racial, the racial. Uh, you know, you know, they they uh, uh definitely definitely against the Japanese. Uh, they were zero mock mercilessly uh, yeah. versus the versus the German. That there's there's a Sergeant Snafu uh, cartoon about venereal disease. Which is pretty jarring because it's like this kind of Warner Brothers style. Everything is in the sound and everything. It just feels like a Warner Brothers cartoon, and they're talking about venereal disease. <laughs> it's just <Yeah. laughs> what you know. And then and there's then there's then there's cartoons with characters you know today that you'll never see on TV, like you know Bugs Bunny nips the nips, stuff right. like that. Um, it's just Popeye. You know, Popeye, yeah, yeah. Popeye was on there. Uh, gosh, there's there's been a lot of them out there that uh, you know that 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 fought, you know that they. You know, used for propaganda purposes. My my daughter, we go to the Hornet. For, we're members of the Hornets. The Hornets right here in Alameda, and um, uh, there are there's a there's a children's room with a loop of cartoons which she loves to watch. One is one is one is a version of the Three Little Pigs, where the the house it's it's kind of a it's kind of a uh, altered version of the Disney cartoon. It's by Disney, but the house is not made of bricks. The house is made of savings of, of Canadian war bonds, and of course the big bad wolf is a Nazi. Uh, there's a there's one about uh, Minnie Mouse saving Greece, so they can she can take it down, have it recycled, and turn it in, into munitions. Um, there was I think there's one about uh, from the war about it's Donald Duck paying his income tax because it helps the war, you know stuff right. like that. So um so it's like all these all these all these practical characters that you know from you know other cartoons they were they were just repurposed for the war, and and, and in fact that in the fact that that that. Three Little Pigs thing is the Three Little Pigs cartoon. It's all the same artwork, just with some things added into it to make it uh, more. Oh, look, look! There's there's the there's the cartoon buff behind me. Um, so so yeah, the, the the everything everything in the in the everything in in media here that was that was big at the time was harnessed to, to try to try to bolster the war effort and keep people involved. Hey, best uh, I got how important how important was uh. How important was the propaganda war uh, uh, in World War II? I think it was very well. It, you know, obviously, for con totalitarian countries, it was the, it was the reason they were able to do what they did. Uh, for our country, I think it was important for for getting Americans serious about the war. Um, people didn't people don't seem to realize that uh, um, on the east coast of the United States, after the declaration of war by Germany upon the United States, people didn't take it very seriously. Um, they, they they didn't observe the blackout. They didn't they didn't do the things they needed to do to make the East Coast safe. And as a result, German U-boats uh, pr prowled up and down the East Coast, sinking American ships within view of the land. I mean, you could actually Coast. watch the ship sink from standing from the beach. You could watch uh, men die out there. Yeah. yeah, you could be in New York and Manhattan, look out and see a, a tanker burning. You know, right yeah. off the coast. Um, so so uh, so. The American public wasn't prepared for for the war. I mean, that that if you study the years running up to it, there was a lot of anti-war sentiment, a lot of enthusiasm for not getting involved. Roosevelt running on the on the platform that we would not be involved in a, in a European war, um, while at the same time taking steps to prepare our, our fleet and to to put things in motion to to uh, harness Americans' uh, industrial power for the war. So the so the American people did need a little coaxing to do the right thing. Um, and then there are things there are things during the war that you know like like rationing and like the the the, the deprivations that the American public had to go through that sort of had to be explained to them. Here's why we're doing this. Here's you know, you know here's why you have to recycle your grease. Here's why you know here's why you don't have, you can't buy more than one pair of tires every every two years. You know here's why you can't buy a new car because it's being used to make factories being used to make tanks. Yeah, I think uh, what was it like a three-year period between forty-two and forty-five or uh, forty-six that there's brand there was no brand new cars made. Yeah. That period. Uh, so when someone says they get a a forty-four, uh, uh, you know, Lincoln, you know they're lying. <laughs> They've got a forty-four Lincoln. It's probably like a a a, a license-built Allison uh, V seventeen ten engine because <laughs> they didn't right. make Lincolns, you know. Right. I mean, it's a uh, yeah. No, no, no. New cars were made during that time. Uh, you're right about the about the Americans. I mean, even before the run before World War II, there was a strong Nazi Germany presence here. Uh, they had a, they, were, they were very active in in the country. 
uh, trying to raise up sentiment. It wasn't until uh, uh, it was wasn't until there was a sinking of, of another ship. I know I, I know the ship's name, but it was the sinking of the ship that caused them to um, lose face and, and 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 political power. It was and, it was almost the very first night of the war, and I I, I can't I, now I'm drawing a blank on the name unfortunately, but uh, um, I know exactly what you're talking about. It was it was a ship uh, headed for headed for England with uh, civilians and a lot of a lot of passengers and a lot of people died as a result. And uh, I know uh, the reason I know the story so well is one of the people on it was a guy named James Goodson, who was a Canadian uh, with American ties, who ended up going from being rescued. I think it was was it the Athena Athena being rescued out of the water to England, volunteering, being in the Eagle Squadron. And then becoming a, a, a fighter pilot in the fourth fighter group, and I think he scored a combination of thirty victories, air to air and air to ground. Um, Goody Goodson, who was uh, one of one of the one of the main mainstays of the fourth fighter group, which is which is another another book I've written was about the fourth fighter group. So uh, I, I've I've heard he his doc his his biography has a really good account of being aboard the ship when it was hit. No one on the ship, nobody on the ship thought, yeah, well we're safe, we're civilians, they wouldn't shoot us. There's no reason to. Yeah, it was supposed to be uh, supposed to be a uh, unspoken term, but you know that wasn't. In fact, uh, in fact, after he shot the ship, uh, uh, Hitler gave him a, uh, a, a gave him a medal. He he, he uh, honored him, uh, the the U-boat captain. Um, yeah, he gave him. He gave him a, uh, I don't know if he gave him an oak leaf, but I know he gave him a, a high award for it. Maybe it might it might have been an oak cluster. But it was very. It was very. It was. Uh, Hitler was very happy that they. He thanked the ship, even though that he shouldn't have. He knew that he made a mistake. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the the Germans didn't want to admit that it was a mistake, right? No. That, that would be. Yeah. That would that would kind of ruin their whole uh, their their whole uh, image, Superman. right? Yeah. The whole cool. Superman type deal. Um, uh, Kevin's writing here. Um, um, our tuber chat. I'm having a hard, trouble buying a car right now. In Canada, there's definitely some sort of shortage going on. Uh, I think that's because there are the chips that, for the cars, the computer chips for the cars uh, that run the motors there. I think they're in really short supply right now. Um, that's why um, in America, too, we're having a hard time with that. Uh, yeah, they just slowed it down. Uh, all those chips are needed elsewhere. Uh, so, so, I mean, I read that book about Eagle Squadron, too. That was a really good book. Um, the, there, there's um, I, I, which there's a there's been a bunch of them over the years, and it's it's, it's the Eagle Squadron is really interesting because it's a uh, you know American volunteers flying in Great Britain before the U.S. enters the war, and um, they got a ton of press and they were kind of really talked up, but they weren't all that good. <laughs> they actually lost more airplanes yeah. than they destroyed, and um, and when when the uh, U.S. got in, got into the war in in earnest, they were kind of folded into the U.S. Air Force or the U.S. Army Air Force. Right, right. No, they were a lot, a lot of them were just playboys, you know, just they wanted to fight, or some were just like, you know, they, they thought it was just going to be like a grand adventure, you know, until they were on fire at, at 10,000 feet. Then it wasn't so much a, a grand adventure. But let me ask you this, Chris. I mean, what can we do to reverse the, the loss of our history? I mean, you know, like, you know, like, um, what can we do to reverse it? I mean, you're doing your part by writing the books, but how do we do our parts besides buying them? I mean, what are we? What, what can we do? Well, my I think my num number one thing to do is experience it. There are places you can go to experience experience history. Um, where where I live is great because we have the the Hornet right here. We've got the USS Jeremiah O'Brien. We've got Rose, the Rosie the Riveter National Monument with a with a Red Oak Victory and. Uh, well, you guys got the USS Hornet. Where, where are you still? In the, are you still in, in the Bay Area, aren't you? I'm in Alameda. Yep, at Al it's Al at, out, out at Alameda Point. And um, when did uh, they get there? It's been there since I don't know, but probably about 1997. It's been there for a while. Um, in fact, as 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 a former bosun's mate in the Navy, I look at it and I think like that thing needs paint. Um, but, uh, but it's a great place to visit. Like I said, my daughter likes to visit it, and uh, uh, they've got. They've got airplanes on board. It's, it's it's a great museum to visit because it's basically unchanged. They haven't done they haven't they haven't turned it into an amusement park, or a you know a, a, a virtual theater or whatever. It's still a carrier with everything a carrier would have. Um, but you know, beyond that, um, there's there's museums in your in your area that you can go to that are that you can you can learn from. More than that, find somebody who knows about the history. 
and talk to them about it and talk about their family's history with with the war, what their what their family was doing. And if they if, and if they don't know or or if you don't know about your own family's history, find somebody who can help you help you learn about it. That's honestly one of my most enjoyable parts about doing this is talking to people who's who's uh, uncles, grandfathers, great uncles, whatever were in the war, and they don't understand what they did. Um, there was a, there was a there was a Tuskegee Airman named Joseph Ellsbury, who um, and I, I talked to his his uh, a guy who was married to his niece, um, and uh, the family you know he was he was a Tuskegee Airman yeah, but then after the war he started drinking and he couldn't couldn't handle being out of the military, and then like you know just he, he died in the fifties, and we kind of like doesn't talk about him anymore. Um, what I discovered writing the book about Tuskegee Airmen is that Joseph Ellsbury shot down four enemy airplanes. He might have gotten a fifth one. Um, he was decorated at the same time as Benjamin O. Davis and uh, Lee Archer. He was a very big deal. He was a very big deal. I, I found a picture of him with Joe, with Joe Lewis sitting in the cockpit of his airplane. And, you know, he was a big deal. Joe Ellsbury was an important guy. Um, he just, he after the war, got he couldn't handle going back to the same country he'd left. Yes. How devastating must that have been, Chris? Uh, you, you put your life on the line for the country. Uh, and, and and I thought about this so much. I, I you know, I it just stuck 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 with me so much. Was you know how you know when people get that raw raw bullshit with the flag, you know the American flag, you know mm -hmm. the American flag. It, it, there's a lot of shame underneath that flag. That flag is is as a uh, there's a lot of shameful uh, 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 history in that flag. And yes. one of it is one of them is the uh, the segregation of the army and you know of the arm uh, armed forces having a, a, a black man put his life on the line for you, fly dangerous missions, get shot down, you know, and um, then come back and get treated like a secondhand citizen. Yep. You know, yep. White, whites this way, colors this way, you know, can't go inside of the same restaurant. You know, I could fly, I could fly, uh, uh, you know, I could, you know, it's like that line from, I mean, it's like that line from Rambo, you know, he's talking about how he, he could drive all this equipment and, and this and that. And he did all this, but it doesn't, doesn't mean shit when he's out in the real world because no one look, no one respects him. Right. And, and, and it's just like th those men put, put their lives on the line. And, uh, and this is what we're, and this is what we get. I mean, it's totally true. I mean, I mean, and, and for Joe's family to hear the story of who he was, was hugely important. He went from being this kind of this, this, forgotten character in their family to this, to this hero. And, and I felt so good about that. Um, there's, there's been other cases where it's like, you know, so there's a guy that the, 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 the most, the most recent book I, I published was this one about the uh, 362nd fighter group. And um, I was doing some research on, I was actually researching one of the captions for one of the pictures. And I happened to sort of, I'm not sure how I found a relative of the guy in the picture. Um, as it turned out, this guy had passed away and, uh, was buried in an unmarked grave, um, and I helped his family get the the, the VA provides a, a, a headstone for for veterans who've died. So I helped steer the family toward that, so this guy could, could be remembered by his family. Um, you know, stuff like that is, is hugely rewarding. But it, but but to, back to the point about how does ordinary people connect with this stuff? Um, there are there are ways to do it. Um, one of my favorites out here we have a thing called uh, Spirit of Forty Five, and they have it out at the San Jose Historical society uh park and uh they have they have reenactors they have not just reenactors with like the military junk but also people in civilian clothes from the period um and uh they talk they, we, we talk about talk about that period there's there's big band music it's a whole feel of, that kind of immersive feel of being in it i will admit i i have a i have a, I have a set of class a's that i wear <laughs> we, we do a model display because the models models are a great way of showing all the things that were in the war that you couldn't possibly stick into kelly park in san jose um, right. you, can't, you can't land a B-17 at Kelly Park or you can land it once, um, but uh, yeah. you wouldn't go out again. Um, but there are events like that all over the place. And, and I also was, if you know the big dates in World War II history, like June 4th is Midway. June 6th is is the, the landing at Normandy, uh, December 7th. Uh, pay attention to what's going on around you because there, there usually are rem remembrances of these things. Memorial Day and Veterans Day, those are really great great reasons to get out and, and, and see what's going on in your community to honor what people have done and to sort of connect with the stories and uh and and just keep your ears and eyes and ears open and things the things we experience today all have roots that go back 80 years um they didn't just start they didn't just materialize out of thin air now they came out of um that period 
things things like things like a, like an like a like a health maintenance or organization. The first HMO was started to help the people that worked at the Kaiser shipyards. That's where Kaiser Permanente exists now. Kaiser doesn't have ships anymore, but they certainly have the HMO left over from back when they were building ships. Um, you know, it's the, the stuff all around. You just have to kind of open your eyes and and uh, and and tune into the history. Uh, talk a little bit about your new book that you just showed us. Uh, that's the three second, right? That's, oh yeah, this this one, this one. Is that yeah, the blue? Uh, this this is a this is a kind of a favorite of mine. The uh, three sixty second fighter group. Woo. Um, Thunderbolts Triumphant, which is about the 362nd Fighter Group, which uh, every, everyone knows about the about the Eighth Air Force, which is the guys flying with Mustangs to Germany with the bombers and you know these long missions. Um, the, uh, the these guys in the Ninth Air Force were flying tactical support missions for ground troops. Um, a lot of interdiction, a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, close air support, and so um, so their story their story really didn't get told very well. But this group was really interesting um, when I. First started working on this, which is 1997, so a long time ago. Stop back there. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so um, uh, again, I got to know a lot of a lot of the people actually in the book, and um, their story was interesting. They went over to England in, in 1944. They were there before the before the invasion. They flew missions before the before the invasion. Um, after after the invasion, they moved over to the continent, and they got these really interesting missions to fly. Um, they, there was a, there was a dam that, that if the, if the army had crossed a valley, the Germans would have flooded the dam or, or bro broken the dam and flooded the valley. So they bombed, they bombed the dam ahead of that. So the floodwaters came and went, um, right. pretty impressive work. They, they attacked uh, Brest Harbor and they, they sank what turned out to be, um, the incomplete French battleship Clemenceau that they were trying to tow out to, to, uh, sink in, in the, in the, in the harbor to, to block the harbor. Um. They 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 knocked out a uh, German a German radar station and uh, it was it was placed on a, on a hill amongst other hills, so it would be impervious to being bombed by small air you know small fighter bombers. Um, the one that got me the the one that I discovered the very last second before the book went to, to print that I managed to get in there, um, when the, the when 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 Patton had his headquarters in Nancy. Um, they started. They started getting shelled. There was a there was a, a big rail gun that was firing from somewhere and dropping these huge shells into the town. One of them actually landed in the in the building across the street from Patton, and uh, Patton wrote home and said, you know, he was he ran out, was helping to get people out of the rubble of that building when other st shells started falling in. And he he wrote home. He said, I've never been more frightened in combat than I was by this. Um, so so they used different means to figure out where the target was. What it was was a great big rail gun. This, this artillery piece so big it was mounted on, on railroad tr trucks that they would push into a tunnel and then pull out on a big curved bit of track and fire at, at the town, specifically shooting at Patton. Um, and they tasked one of the squadrons in, in, in this group with going and knocking out the, uh, the, the gun. Um, how, they, how, they did, how they did it, they, they flew up with a couple bombs under, under the wings of each aircraft and skip them into the tunnel opening, yeah. and believe it or not, they, sure enough, one of them went, went right in there and broke the broke the back of the artillery piece and killed a bunch of people and uh, um, stopped stopped the firing from happening. Um, and and uh, I, I I found that story from a couple different sources, and then I went back to the the squadron source. The squad the squadron got the record, and it, the record for that said, you know, the date just another day of skipping bombs into tunnels. Yeah, no, no realization even by the guys how important what they were doing was. Um, so it's it, it was a fun book to write. The one downside of writing books like that, well, there's two downsides. You meet these guys and they pass away, which is really a bummer. You get to become friends with people who are already in their 80s or 90s, and they, you know, they do pass away. Um, the other downside is as you're writing the narrative to this, you kind of know the fates of people. And there's some there's some there's some pilots that, that I, I kind of got to know through the research and through their letters and things that when you get to the point where they are killed in action, it really actually affects you as a writer. Um, there's a guy named uh, John McMahon who um, whose family put together this this beautiful commemorative album of him of his told all the stories, had all his letters in it. Um, they interviewed uh, his best friend, Tom, Tom uh, Payton, and um, had Tom's comments in there. And so, in the mission where Johnny McMahon gets killed, um, that was that was hard to write. It, it really is hard to write because you, you get to know these guys. They're these are a bunch of 22, 23, 24 year old idiots who are flying, you know, state of the art airplanes, 
like it's nothing. Um, when they're not flying, they're doing stuff like rearranging the slats on the on the on the wooden boardwalk so that people fall into trenches at night. You know, playing jokes on each other and doing all the stuff that 22, 23 year old people do um, yeah. when they're not supervised. And then when when they when they are killed in combat, it really does have a have an impact, even on the writer. Even though you know it's coming, even though you know you know it's coming, you know. So I mean, you're watching uh watching you know you know that uh, uh Lieutenant Waldron like one of my personal heroes, you know, um, from Torpedo Eight. Uh, uh, I just every time Midway comes around, I mean, I p always put up a. Uh, uh, I always put up a picture of Midway, you know, uh, if I can, I put up a picture of him. Um, you know, his, he was so brave, you know, he led his men into certain death, but he didn't waver, you know, it's just, you know, incredibly courageous. Um, you're right. It's, it's, um, you know, it, uh, you know, I, I, I heard about, you know, what Knickick, Niles Knickick, he was, he, he was a, pilot well-known pilot and uh he crashed in 19 i think 1939 out here in, in one of the lakes he was training or no he was was it was it in the lake or was he in uh man, or, or maybe he was maybe he was down south but he was training and he died he named the the, the stadium after or university of iowa plays after him and i you know because he you know i was i was reading about that and hearing about that and then i read about pruitt I heard that he died basically the same way. He died in training. He was training yeah. somebody and he died. And yet, I don't see any stating this name for him. Um, you know, and I, was a, yeah, he flew. He flew all the Tuskegee Airmen. He was a Tuskegee Airman, and all those guys flew longer than their tours um, uh, were supposed to be. Um, and uh, uh, he got sent back to to fly as, as an instructor. And he was writing. He was writing back to the. The, the, the group in Italy, please bring me back out for combat because he he honestly he honestly knew what was more dangerous in training that wasn't combat at that point. Um, yeah, and, I'm I'm sure he did. Um, yeah, it was just uh, you know it's just it's just sad when I heard about that. I'm like, wow, great pilot like that, and that's how he died. It just really sucked, you know. It, it hurts because he was such a great pilot, and you know, and and a, and role model. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I got to go back to another war real quick because I'm really fascinated by your your uh, response to this, uh, being a historian and whatnot. And but, um, what do you think about the statues coming down? Oh, I think it's fine. I think it's I think it's a fantastic thing. I think that uh, if you know the if you know the history of the statues themselves, they weren't put up uh, right after the Civil War by people who remembered these these figures as the people that they knew. They are put up as ways to, to sort of assert um, white, super, white supremacy in the in, in sort of the post-Confederate South. Uh, they were they were they were there to celebrate these people who didn't win. They're, they didn't win the war. I mean, that's just you know. I, I was I think it's funny when people carp about uh, participation trophies when they also defend these Confederate statues, which are like the ultimate participation trophies. But um, but the the whole the whole reason for them existing is to assert that you know, these are the these are the admirable people from that period. And they aren't. They 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 made bad decisions. Robert E. Lee made a bad decision. He didn't have to go fight for the fight with the Army of Northern Virginia. He didn't have to make the decision. Um, you know, and, and and somebody pointed out there's there's no picture there's no there aren't many statues of good Confederate generals, which is kind of funny. You know, there's no good, there's no long street statue anywhere because, you know, he spoke his mind. You know, we're going to lose. We're, we need to stop doing this, you know. Um, so, so them coming down, yeah, put them, put them in, put them someplace and put them, put them somewhere where there's some context around them. Don't put them in the middle of the city where it seems as if that is a civic endorsement of, of these people versus the real victors of the war and the real people who they, suffered in the war. Do you think that, do you think if we took them and, and, uh, and reestablished them on the battlefields that they were in, that, that the ones that we still have left, do you think that would be a, a way to um, to acknowledge? Because this is probably the one thing I, 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 I'll be honest with you. I've walked, I mean, I'm, have you walked Gettysburg yet? Yeah. 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 It's, um, it's, it's a haunted place. It's yeah. hallowed. And um, I just, uh, I agree. There's some. There's some. There's some that don't deserve it. Um, you know, Bedford Forest definitely not. Uh, you know, uh, definitely, definitely not. But someone like a Robert E. Lee. I mean, you know, I. 
I just can't help it, man. I just, I just, I just feel really like it's, it's not right. I just, you know, no. And the thing is, though, what cracks me up more than anything else is when people mention, I mean, you know, this by reading about, you know, by researching this, but nobody wins the civil war. I don't understand yeah. how people say, well, we won the civil war. Nobody wins the civil war. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, you might win, but really, have we really, what have we really won? We have never right. really fully healed the, the nation. No, no. This is it's, you. You achieved your aims. Is, is all it all it is, you know. Um, but you know, I, I think I think putting putting statues in their con in context makes sense. I think sticking them and sticking them in, sticking them in, sticking them in the middle of town, um, maybe not because it just doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, yeah, I, I I think I think you know I I I think that I'm I'm with you about that. I definitely am with you, but I don't this. I think that if we put them if we relocated them. To, because remember, some of these some of the statues we have up now, like Custer or, or 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 you know or or Grant. I mean, how the hell do we have Grant up as a statue? I mean, Grant was a brutal and horrible general. You know, if you really look at it, he was just he he was just no, he was terrible. Uh, uh, Sheridan was a much better general than General <laughs> Grant. But people don't understand that. They don't. They think, well, Grant won. Why don't you go see how exactly he always did win that, yeah. and then come back to me about that? You know, um, he killed thousands needlessly, and yet here we got him on the twenty dollar bill or whatever the bill he's on, and we got statues of him. And it's just like you're right. It's context. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just wondering, do you think it's fair that? that we put the statues, like I said, not everybody deserves it. So if we put them on what remains of our battlefields, do you think that would be a, a way to acknowledge them? I mean, do you think that you think we, we as a, as a country could actually be okay with that? I, I hope so. I, I think we, I think we need to recognize exactly how about bad war is in general. That's, I mean, that's, that's an American tradition is to minimize the, the impact of war. Um, the, the, I, I read a piece not too long ago about the, uh, the first uh, exhibition by Matthew Brady of photographs from the Gettysburg and how shook, shaken up people were because yeah. they had been able to keep themselves re totally removed from the reality of, of war, even when the war was going on on American soil. Um, we, we, it's, a, it's a national pastime of ours. Minimize how bad war actually is. Uh, so, so I'm hoping we can do that. I think, I think there's, there's also, there's also a lot of, there's, there's also a lot of uh, redemption to come out of people when people survive war and, and get through the experience there can be a there can be a redemptive quality to it that's 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 um that, that's that's really positive and uplifting um the experience is horrible but people can, can, can come out of it changed for the better sometimes um we need, we need to be able to, to talk about the entirety of that experience um you know nobody nobody comes out of combat the same person that they were nobody okay. comes out of the war the same person they were when they went in and uh, we need to be need to be realistic about it. I think I think after the war in the in the fifties, I think the, the, the misconception that people would just come back and just resume things as if nothing had happened is what caused a lot of a, a, an awful lot of personal and social str uh, strife and stress. I mean, you think about it. You know, after uh, someone actually said that, I think someone mentioned that from like from nineteen you know forty one up till up till whatever the year I read this was that America had been involved in a, in every single war in the world, except for maybe one. There's like one war that they didn't have any part of it, but every other war in the world, they actually had their fingers in every single one, every single war. I mean, think about it. We were World War II and some 45. You're back in Korea, you know, back in 1950. I mean, you don't even have a chance to even do anything. You're, and next thing you know, you're being recalled. Oh, yeah. I mean, and then you turn around, and then next thing you know, there's the early seeds of the Vietnam War was in the early 60s. And it's just like, wow, we, we've always been in a constant state. And, and I wonder what it is about America that makes it feel like we need to be in, in somebody else's business. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And, and, and it's sad because there are other ways we can be in people's business in a positive way that we don't fully embrace. Um, when you hear people screaming about us giving foreign aid to other countries, uh, my brother-in-law is, is a, a deputy director in USAID. They do amazing work. They completely change the attitudes of people in those countries that they work in. They change people's lives for the better. It doesn't cost nearly as much as dropping a bunch of laser-guided bombs on people. It's it's positive stuff that lasts for a long time and completely alters people's uh, 
take on from the United States. And then we turn around and do something through, uh, you know, the, the brute force statecraft of military action that, that undoes that. And uh, it's just, just it's, it's just stupid. We need to, we need to stop, step back and, and uh, realize how powerful um, diplomacy, generosity, and empathy can be. It really can be. Um, do, do you, uh, do you feel like, uh, I mean, yeah, and, and do you think we spend, you know, as a, 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 a do you think we spend too much on defense now? I think we do, and uh, the sad part is I, I I know a lot about the inner workings of the Defense Department and how and, and the appropriations process. So we waste a ton of money. Oh God, we yeah. could, we could have the exact same level of protection with the, with the exact same systems and spend a lot less on it because money just money goes in the Pentagon and disappears. Um, and, and and the procurement process itself is 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 full of problems. So oh I, I think I think we need to do a reset on that at some point. I you know it's important for us you know obviously you know. Uh, events around the world show that we need to be prepared. We need to. We need, we should. We should have the technological advantage that really is important for us to kind of keep ourselves safe. At least, at least give give people who do us harm the idea that we can reach out and touch them if we want to. Um, but with the same token, we we should also make sure that we don't cause our country to sort of implode from within by not spending things on on uh, spending money on things we need to have. Yeah, I agree. It feels it feels like that. You know, I tell you what, it really felt like you know during the you know during the Trump years, you know, and running up to it, it felt like that we were, you know, we have kept so many countries ourselves uh, destabilized, and you know, throughout especially South America. I mean, South America has never been able to get their shit together at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and we never we never let them, uh, no. and we feel and it feels like we're actually the victim of our own device here. You know, Russia is finally as Russia is doing what we have done to every other country for for dozens of years, and they have destabilized us. Yeah, the, the, all the, the all the immigration issues from Central America are a direct result of the things we did in the eighties. It's yeah. just, you know we we toppled governments that we shouldn't have messed with. We created situations where uh, the wrong people were um, the wrong people were both were were were, were uh, given resources because they were anti-communist um but it, it totally destroyed countries like honduras and el salvador as a result and so we're, we're th th that migration is the exact is the direct result of that um yeah all of our problems are sort of self-inflicted in a lot of cases it and, really uh, it has been it really has been um so i'm gonna ask you one thing uh, real quick before i let you go uh just tell us uh tell us just for the hell of it tell us your 10 favorite war planes of World War II, regardless of the country. Gosh, okay. Uh, 10 favorites. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not really big on the German stuff, I, you know, but, uh, but uh, I can tell you the, I've, I've, I've flown in a Mustang and I've flown in a B-17. So those are top two right there. Um, I, I, the the P-47 is a favorite of mine because, you know, spent, I spent all these years working on this book about them. <laughs> so I love the P-47. Um, that'd be three. I think that uh, the, the, uh, the, the ferry Firefly is a is a kind of a lesser known airplane, but 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 one I really like. Uh, it flew in Korea and World War II. Um, gosh, um, Corsair, Wildcat, Hellcat, all those Navy aircraft I love, um, and uh, the SBD Dauntless, and uh, you know the B twenty five. My my grandfather flew one 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 of the early ones of those, um, so so I have a connection to that. And I should say the B twenty four because my other grandfather couldn't enlist because he was too, too important as a chemist up at Willow Run uh, there in Michigan, working on the B-24s. He kept trying to enlist and they kept dragging him back to the factory to get back to work on, on artificial rubber composites to keep those airplanes going. So I'm, uh, actually, uh, I'm actually about 15 minutes away from Willow Run. So, well, there you go. See, if anybody's nearby you, that's a great place to go and, and, and reconnect with history. Yeah, uh, I go out to the, uh, I've been out to the Inky Air Museum and actually, the Tuskegee Airmen—they uh, have a, a museum out here now. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that just reopened not that long ago. Um, yeah. Um, so, when's your new when's your new book coming out? And how can it? How can how can people get it? Uh, the new, new next book's coming out on. Uh, well, the, this this book's available now. You can, you can get it. I, I would say through the publisher Casemate or Amazon if you really want to. Uh, patronize Amazon. Um, the new book co is coming out on, on the 17th on the Mustang. That's going to be available almost everywhere on, it's an Osprey publication. So, um, so you can get it pretty much every, every, every 
uh, bookstore site you can possibly think of. And I'd, I always strongly suggest get, go to an independent bookstore's website and buy it there. Um, or go to, a, go to a museum's book, uh, gift shop and buy it there. That's a good, a good way to make sure your dollar is going to, to perpetuate history, too. Um, so what's next for you? Are you uh, taking a, are you going to be going on a tour for this book? Uh, we be, you know, doing speaking tours. I mean, how, and how, how well do military books like this actually sell? They, they have their own little uh, built in audience. So they, so they can become, can, they can be confident of selling a certain number, um, which, which is great. It's not like it's going to go out there to sort of just disappear. It's going to sell X number and that's enough for the publisher to make, make their, their money back. And, and uh, that sort of keeps keeps the chain keeps the keeps the assembly line rolling for people like me. Um, but uh, yeah, sometimes I, sometimes I'll do a tour on the West Coast. Um, there's some places to go to talk, and I'd, I'd like to be able to get back out there and do that again. I didn't do it all last year, obviously. And yeah, um, photo bomb, just go with it. I know. Well, well, somebody somebody wants our dinner, so I'm gonna have to be. Oh, okay. Something. All right. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll let you go then. Uh, I would just like to thank you so much, Chris. This has been so much fun. I've been I've been looking forward to this since uh, I started do, you know since I started doing the blog interview. I've been wanting to do this, so um, so so happy to talk to you. And um, I'd like to thank everybody out in the chat that came out and and uh, hung out with me for the nighttime edition of <laughs> Eight Questions with. And uh, we will see you tomorrow night, hopefully for eight o'clock. For uh, uh, for Christy Adams, who runs the Nightmare Toys uh, uh, bookstore or uh, toy store, um, yeah, she runs the toy store. Um, and, uh, we'll be talking to her at eight o'clock tomorrow. And um, so, yeah, thanks a lot, Chris. I appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, Thank you. It was great. To, it was great talking to you again after all these years. Yeah, well, we'll do. We'll we'll talk like this again. You know, we, we don't have to go live. We can just talk. Yeah. So, uh, I definitely, uh, I'll definitely want, uh, I definitely want an autograph copy of your, uh, of your new book in February for sure. You got it. You got it. Um, all right, folks, then uh, be safe, take care, and until the next one. Hey, hey hang there. Stay, stay right there, Chris.